Welcome to another episode of Studio 6 Paranormal Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Hill, with my co-host, Shane Feek, and we have our special guest, Josh Hughes. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate, uh, you know, uh, spending some time with you guys on a blistering cold uh, Sunday night. Right. Yeah. No kidding. <clears throat> so, yeah, um, it's a little bit out of uh, out of no- normal stuff to for me to be doing this a little bit at home because of the fact of the weather and snow and so um it just was a little bit easier to do it from here but um first off uh i wanted to um thank everybody for for tuning in um on a sunday night um i am excited that our guest here is going to talk to us a little bit about um some of his his experiences with the paranormal um we have some great stories on tap so why don't i um let Josh, introduce a little bit while who he is and what he does. So here's Josh. Yeah, um, that's a, a pretty uh, wide question there. Um, mm-hmm. I guess, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, my my journey with the paranormal has really been a, a, that of my life so far. Um, it started uh, off when I was a very young kid, um, just experiencing things in my childhood home that uh, I really wasn't sure what was going on. Right. Uh, and being a younger kid, you're not sure if this is something you can talk to your parents about. So at the time, I, I went over to the school library and uh, dug through the card catalog um, to find the only book about ghosts in the school, um, which is actually about two miles from my house right now. Um, and that's when my kind of passion for uh, research um, and interest uh, in trying to figure out what I was experiencing um, kind of started. Uh, and then that's really kind of just carried out through my whole life. You know, in high school, it was kind of more of the thrill seeking, you know, going to a graveyard on Halloween with your friends to hopefully get that's scared cool. by something. Um, and then in college, it really kind of came full circle. Um, my uh, roommate and I were started getting into the TV shows. That's when Ghost Hunters was getting big. Um, and that's when Paranormal State came out. Uh, Paranormal State involved a bunch of college kids that were uh, investigating the paranormal, right? Um, So at that point in time, we actually decided to uh, put together our own uh, paranormal investigation group at UW Oshkosh. Uh, And that was the only group that's ever been there uh, since then, actually. It was the first and only. Um, And we were actually fortunate enough to actually meet um, uh, the crew from Paranormal State. They actually came to UW Oshkosh. Uh, They did a speaker series uh, during October, obviously. Um, and we got to go out to dinner with them, talk about the show, talk about their investigations. And as you know, a bunch of college kids and, uh, very fresh to this whole investigation stuff. Uh, it was mind blowing to be able to have that experience. Uh, and from there, we just kind of went on a bunch of investigations or throughout our final three years of college. Um, some pretty notable places across the Midwest that we got to before, uh, some of the bigger TV shows got to actually, That's cool. um, And then after college, I just kind of carried on doing uh, residential investigations, you know, here and there, I'd get people that needed help with some things, uh, needed help with research. That's always been kind of my forte is helping with research, because a lot of things people just don't realize how to find on their own. Right. And in the past couple of years, um, it's really picked up for me. Uh, I've kind of met like-minded individuals like Jade, uh, friends across the country that are into this and it seems like the whole paranormal thing is kind of taking on a new direction. I can't really explain that fully, but it just seems like things are kind of going away from the, you know, the the TV show kind of gimmicky stuff. And it's becoming more of a real thing for people. Mm -hmm. Um, Very exciting to see. Um, And just uh, this past summer was my first year doing the uh, Waukesha ghost walk, um, uh, which is uh, a national nationwide company that does ghost walks and many, uh, cities in Wisconsin and across the Midwest. Uh, they even have ghost walks in Puerto Rico and Hawaii. Oh, so it's very, oh, wow. um, so, but I do the ones in Waukesha where you get to learn a bit about, um, Waukesha's history and the ghosts and the true crime. And even there's a story about aliens, uh, wow. on the tour. um, and, uh, the past, let's say a couple more years, uh, before that, I've been getting back into more residential hauntings. Uh, even a couple I've done with Jay uh, in Waukesha and a little bit outside of Waukesha. Um, so, yeah, it's just been a really uh, weird, long 
journey uh, that started in Waukesha and now it's kind of really uh, built up the past couple of years in Waukesha again. So it's, it's really kind of come full circle for me. So um, Josh, um, talk a little bit about, um, now I had found out probably last year when I was talking with you that you were now a paid screenwriter. Talk a little bit about that and what that entails and um, what your your goals or what your thoughts are on, on all that. Yeah, so um, that's another thing that I've been doing since a kid, too, is telling stories. I've always just really enjoyed telling stories. Uh, as a young kid, it was ghost stories around the fire. Um, and then eventually when I got to college, I, I discovered that, hey, you, know, you can get paid to actually like write movies. You know, it always kind of seemed like a something that wasn't real. You know, you see the Academy Awards and you see these people making these big Hollywood movies. And then I come to find that you can actually learn how to do this and it can be your major. Um, so I rolled in the uh, radio TV film program at UW Oshkosh, uh, which is arguably one of the better programs in the state. Um, and, and one of the highlights that I, I uh, had in my college career um, was that I wrote and directed and even starred in a, um, a Stephen King uh, adapted short story. So many, oh, people, wow. many yeah. people aren't familiar with it, but Stephen King uh, does this program where he, um, he allows you to buy the rights to his short stories for a dollar. They're, they're oh. called Dollar Babies. Um, and I discovered this my senior year of college and I again, directed um, uh, Strawberry Spring, which is a, uh, a short story from his collection of stories in Night Shift, which is a, a book of short stories. Um, and that was just, you know, like mind blowing. Like Stephen King is my favorite author. I've read most of his books. Uh, and to be able to adapt his short story into a screenplay and then actually make it was out of this world. Uh, and ever since college, um, I've uh, wrote and directed a few short films. Uh, I've helped friends make short films. Uh, in the past couple of years, I've really gotten into writing and editing. Those are my, my two things. I, I write it and then I finish it at the end once it's all shot. Um, it's just something that really keeps me busy. You know, it, it, it drives me. It, it allows me to get those creative juices really out of my head. Um, and pairing along with the, the paranormal stuff, um, one of my first screenplays, um, one of my feature screenplays, uh, was about the things that I experienced as a kid. You know, I was able to research them a bit more and turn into a story um, and kind of get it out of my head, you know, make it not just a memory anymore, make it something that people can actually read and maybe one day possibly see. Uh, because it's, again, it's very difficult to explain those things that when you're a kid. Um, sure. Right, right. Wow, that's that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so is it something where, like, you would want to pitch to somebody in the, in the future or... That's a very, like if you had an uh, idea, it's a very difficult process. Um, I, I'm sure it is. Yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, I, I'm a part of a lot of Facebook groups, uh, Reddit forums uh, on screenwriting and filmmaking in general. I have a lot of colleagues that are into that as well. And it's, it's, it's a really hard grind. You know, you've got to be doing this for years. Um, you know, you can write maybe 20 screenplays. And then your 21st one isn't the actual good one. You know, you just got to. <laughs> yeah, right. It's true. Of most of things. Actually make right, it right. That's decent that people yeah. respond to. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I've read for contests. I uh, linked up with <clears> writers <throat> who are repped by managers who have gotten stuff produced. It, it's all just networking, um, keeping material pumping out. Um, and hopefully one day you can kind of make something of it. Sure. Mm -hmm. I'm not banking on it. Uh, I just really enjoy it. It's fun. Uh, and hopefully I can always make sure that that's a fun thing that I'm doing. You know, it's, it's never well, the one thing that I know, the one thing I know about you is that you, you don't bake on pretty much anything unless it's a kind of a for sure deal. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'm very easygoing, you know, just kind of right, see right. what happens. Um, if it happens, it happens. Right. You exactly. know. Everything is meant to be for a reason. That's how I feel. Right, right, right. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about um, you have you like to do documentaries as as from what I'm what I'm I'm being told for a while now that you know um, you had a documentary idea or you have one in the works um, and until the recent until until something comes along where you say hey that's what I really want to do do you have any idea of 
like a location of what you would think would be a really good as a documentary, like in a paranormal field. Right. Yeah. And I, I'm seeing that um, becoming more of a trend recently. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen the one with the conjuring house that came out. Um, I saw someone, I, I don't know where I saw this, but it was uh, this team went into a haunting a haunted house with uh, the guy that played, I think Jason in the, in the Friday the 13th. Yeah. 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 We just interviewed uh, the two of the people that were working with the okay. uh, Kane Hunter. Yeah. Right. So maybe that's where I saw it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, um, so I, it's it's interesting how people are now kind of turning um, haunted locations into uh, documentaries. You know, there's a lot to learn on these things, and and uh, I think it's really cool that people are you know inviting actors, you know, getting sure. kind of, you know the, the the entertainment world uh, into this because I know a lot of people, um, actors, directors, writers, are very interested in the paranormal. Um, but I think uh, what really would pique my interest uh, with a documentary of this sorts would be the the people that are involved with it. Um, and I don't mean the spirits. I mean the actual people that are either living there, renovating it, um, uh, have experiences there. Uh, I think those people can almost be characters in themselves and make something unique. Right. Really because a haunted house is just, it's a house with spirits inside. You might not get anything. So having sure. some sort of character um, that can drive the story along while you're trying to help them with the haunting or discover what's haunting it or doing research, mm -hmm. um, right. yeah, that's what really interests me. Like the, there was a, a one that came out a few years ago. I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was a mockumentary, but it was just a very good, scary movie done in kind of that found footage format. Um, and that was The Blackwell Ghost. Um, okay. That one was on Amazon Prime. I, I probably watched it half a dozen times. It was, it was just a very well done movie by one guy. Um, basically, he didn't believe in ghosts. He wanted to make a documentary about um, staying in a haunted house for a weekend. Mm -hmm. Prove sure. that ghosts were actually real. Uh, again, I think it was fake, um, but it was just a very good horror movie in that sense. Now, do you watch a lot of documentaries, like paranormal documentaries or stuff like that? And do you, if you do, I mean, do you like kind of like say, "Hey, that's a great idea," or I should look into that, or just make, you know, kind of, kind of dissect it a little bit and saying, "Hey, I don't know if I do that," but you know. Yeah, um, you know, coming from the production side, um, you know, I, I can basically make a movie by myself. I can write it, I can shoot it, I can edit it, right? I could even act in it if I really had to. Um, so when I when I see something. Um, a lot of these documentaries that I see, uh, the production value just isn't there. So it just, it's shot poorly. It's edited poorly. It's the lighting's bad. You know, these are things that I always pay attention to and those can unfortunately hurt my opinion of, of some productions. Um, but, you know, I won't push that aside and actually look at the story and what's going on. Is it interesting? Um, do they know what they're doing? Um, mm -hmm. is, is it, you know, enough for an hour and a half? Some of these documentaries, they just stretch them out so long, you know. Yeah, right. It, be, it right. should be 50 minutes, and they make it two hours, and then you just get bored. So it's, um, I know I kind of look at all those things, and, and there's there's a few in my, you know, <clears throat> I'm like, you know, that's very memorable. He did a great job. Um, you know, I want to see more of this, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like a lot of times they come up with like certain graphics, and they keep showing the same thing over and over and over and over. It's like, okay, we've seen that clip ten times already. Right, right. And so it's like, come on. You got to change it up. <laughs> yeah. You know, but um, well, that's great. I mean, I, I, I firmly believe, I, since, you know, since I've known you for a while now, and, and I know that, you know, you're talented in, in other areas like that in the paranormal, but um, tell us a little bit about your behind the camera. You know, that's kind of like your forte, your job, basically, right? Right. Yeah, that's... um. Basically, my, my full-time job is during the day. You know, that's where the, the paychecks come through. <laughs> um, yeah. I, uh, I'm a shooter and I'm an editor from a, for, uh, an ad agency, right? So we make a lot of commercials and that is documentary style work. Um, so bringing that over to the paranormal side, I found being just as an investigator, um, I get scared easily. It's very frightening when you're experiencing things. Hmm. Um, and I'm a, I'm a man. I can admit that. I get scared with these things like many of us do. Uh, right. 
but I've come to find that when I'm behind a camera or shooting something, that that fear kind of goes away in a sense. Huh. Uh, yeah, you're focusing on the tech. I, I yeah. can't quite explain it. It's just like I've even had instances where I'm filming something and I'll feel like something over my shoulder, like almost like watching my camera, like what what are you doing? What's right. going on here? Um, right. And normally I would probably jump out of my pants, but <laughs> when I have a, like almost like another job to do when I have to make sure that things are being filmed, uh, mm -hmm. that fear kind of goes away and you like, nope, I got to stick, stick with this. I have to make sure I get the shots, you know, because when didn't you, you, didn't you, didn't you, um, film something or did, was that, I saw a clip where you filmed something. Um, I don't know if it was a commercial or something like that, but you actually had some paranormal experience. Right. Yeah, we were, um, that was for work, and my boss, um, he, he, he believes in, in spirits and ghosts uh, because our office is, some people say haunted, um, mm -hmm. and we were down uh, at, God, I can't remember the name, but it's down by the lakefront. It's this big old Italian style building. Um, we were there filming some concert series uh, for a yeah. local artist. And uh, we had this GoPro that was um, gathering the entire room so it could see everything. And in the center of their room, there's these two big uh, floor to ceiling glass doors. Uh, and you can hear it clear as day in the clip. My boss says, action, you know, we're ready to start filming. And these doors just swing open. And everybody in the room just kind of like takes a collective breath like, did that just happen? Like everybody <laughs> saw these doors that were deadbolt locked just mm -hmm. swing open and you can even hear somebody in the clip say i think there's a ghost here like we just we just felt and saw something happen wow that's pretty and cool. that's certainly something i can provide you jay after after we're done here if you want to yeah it. i've actually that's seen it actually. yeah cool i think question. you would send it, i think you sent it to me you have to send it to shane it's pretty cool yeah, send it to me. <clears throat> um now didn't didn't that happen more than once or was it just once that particular thing we were filming, it just happened that one time. Okay. Um, but as I, as we got there for the day, we were setting up, um, you know, bringing the cameras and the gear in. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, my eyes were just like kind of drawn to those double doors. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of like moving already a little bit. Um, and there was like... Now that's, down, that's, that's in Waukesha? That's in Milwaukee, down by the lakefront. Oh, down by the lake. Okay. Right. I can try to look it up here as we're talking. Yeah, about. yeah, and yeah, send me some information. I mean, I sent some pictures, and I could probably maybe gather uh, what a little bit of it is and right. this and that. But yeah, that's it's it sounds intriguing. I mean, I, I kind of like just watching the the faces, you know, the the people that look on their faces. It's just like, what right. was that? Yeah, you know, was, everyone just kind of like stopped and was like, that that really just happened, right? Those doors, right? Were and when you get that aha, when you get that aha moment, they kind of like, holy crap, you know what I mean? And then you're like, yeah. but since you were shooting and you were talking about you were just doing what you were doing because that's your job, right? You know, it wasn't. And you evidently have two different modes. You know, you have your work mode, and then you have your, you know, relaxed. You know, kind of, you know, what you do at home and this and that. And when you go out to do like paranormal investigations or stuff like that, that's different. Maybe we should just because. You know, we should probably put you up behind the camera all the time, and then you won't be afraid. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, so well, me and uh, Josh did a little bit of investigation um, on Halloween a uh, weekend. Was it? No, it was in August. It was a Friday the thirteenth. In oh, it was a Friday the thirteenth. Uh, Talk a little bit about that bar and a little bit about the history. I'm sure that people really don't realize that, you know, some of these places are kind of tucked away in, you know, the recesses of history. And it's a pretty good story. Yeah. So um, if there's people watching that are uh, in Wisconsin uh, or even near Waukesha, um, uh, there is a bar that's uh, an older part of town called the Club 400. Uh, and it, this area, it's known as a dive bar. That's the that's where the locals go, right? It's it's uh, it's a nice little place to grab a drink and watch a football game. Um, but this building has had quite the history um, in that part of town. Um, it used to be a hotel in 1894. Um, throughout the ages, it's kind of had a, a number of different uh, things take place in, in the building. Um, 
during Prohibition, there was some talk of a speakeasy. Um, there's some very interesting tunnels in the basement that used to go under the streets over to a local brewery um, that is no longer in business. Um, just a very creepy old bar um, that's seen quite a few things. Now, one of the very interesting things, um, I was doing like a little pre-investigation on a Sunday afternoon uh, with my wife and uh, a family friend. Uh, we're in the, the, uh, the basement by these so-called tunnels, uh, and we have something on camera actually captured that uh, says my wife's name, clear as day. Now, when I shared this clip with Jay, uh, I believe he said, um, yeah, there's some sort of musician that you were seeing. Yep. Uh, somebody with a guitar <laughs> in the basement. Um, yep. yep. And this was before I told him any, I didn't even tell him the name of the place. I didn't tell him any history. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so one of the really interesting parts about that place is um, in the 50s, it was purchased by Les Paul's dad and brother. Okay. So if you know Les Paul, he's basically the yep. inventor of the electric guitar. Correct. Um, right. And Les Paul actually played at the opening night party that they had at wow. Club 400. Um, mm -hmm. So then <laughs> my wife and I start to wonder, is Les Paul in the basement saying my wife's name? You know, that if Jay's seeing somebody with a guitar and this, you know, get up, because um, when I brought Jay in there for the first time, I sh showed him, I'm like, this whole wall is covered in Les Paul memorabilia. Sure. Maybe there's a connection made there. Huh. Um, but yeah, so I, I became really good friends with the owners. Um, they said there were some paranormal things going on. I started to do some research. I haven't found anything super concrete on the place because there's been so many things in and out of there. Um, but we do know that there was a couple deaths that took place on the property. Um, and it used to be uh, right next door to Waukesha's busiest railroad area. Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of in the, the, the belief that um, perhaps that's kind of like a, a pipeline for some sort of paranormal activity, especially with how much people used to get on and off that train every day, um, how many buildings used to be in the area. And now there's just really this one really old you know, bar from 1890s. Mm -hmm. Um, there's possibly a lot of energy trapped there, uh, not just mm -hmm. one spirit Paul's haunting that place. Um, but I do think it's, it's kind of like a, I guess Jay called it a portal where things can kind of just come in and out. As mm -hmm. Yeah. Wasn't there a lady upstairs too, that I, that was part of the upstairs. I, I kept getting a certain name. I couldn't remember, but you validated it for me. Uh, when we were in the upstairs bar on the second floor. Right. Yeah. I think you said you were seeing a woman, um, kind of like a homemaker type person. Yeah. Um, um, I think there was a name that we, we both got uh, through my research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that you would it come to you. Um, yeah. So that's a bar that I, I frequently visit with friends. Um, and also for paranormal reasons. Uh, we had that right. 13th investigation where we had a select number of people come through. I gave a, a good yeah. 20 minute, you know, research lesson on the place, you know, and proper uh, techniques for our investigation. Uh, we just kind of let people loose throughout the building at that point. Um, and I actually just cool. uh, recently connected with one of the people that came on that investigation on Facebook. And now um, he's kind of been doing his own investigations uh, across the some cities in uh, Wisconsin here. Um, See actually, who you inspire. <laughs> I think he he was interested in it beforehand, but that kind of like pushed that kind him of pushed him to start doing yeah. this on his own. And he actually said he went back to Club Four Hundred a couple weeks ago. Uh, and the owners are really you know cool with this stuff, so they let him go throughout the building. And he actually sent me a recording of uh, something upstairs that said his name on a spirit box. Oh wow. And it's That's not cool. kind of like, you know, up for debate. Did it say it or not? Like you can clear as day, hear this guy's name. Huh. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, that, that's cool. Because yeah, when we were there, it was, it was, it was a different feeling and it wasn't like a negative feeling or anything like that. You know? And and it just wasn't, you know, it was just, there was a lot of energy. Um, we did. And I did know, know, note that too, that that place at one point was, if, if it's still not, it was a V, uh, a VF, like a upstairs used like, to be a, a veteran's home. Right. Right. And then well, I think we had a couple guys come through on the spirit box that were 
you know, stating that they were military, you know. Correct. So I and think that when we asked how many were there. And, yeah. The interesting part about that is that this individual who went back a couple of weeks ago said they were upstairs in that same area. Um, I wasn't sure exactly what came through on the spirit box, but I think he heard something like D-Day or World War II. Mm -hmm. He heard oh. things associated with a generation that would have been living in that portion of the building. Right. Wow, really cool. right. And I'm sure that a lot of conversations were had back then up there, you know, about this and that. And, Right. Well, the, so, yeah. I've seen uh, newspaper articles that say that uh, the veterans would stay up there and they'd come down to the bar every morning at 7 a.m. to play games, read the paper, and, and have a drink in the morning. Um, sure. So, I mean, there was a lot of, you know, as the greatest generation, right? Um, and uh, there, there's probably still a lot of energy left there, um, especially if they were in a daily routine. Going right. Down the stairs. Sure. So maybe it's something that they're still doing, you know? Yeah. Could be a loop or it could be something residual or you know something like that the imprint is still there you know what i mean and a, a lot of that whole area around there with the railroad still being there and <clears throat> and this and that you know i mean it's just yeah it's it's ripe for paranormal activity and did you ever find out remember when i told you that i had kind of i saw a guy getting beat up in the alley did you ever find anything out about like a death or like something related to that remember when i i don't know if you remember i mentioned that i think i you. found a few um old newspaper articles that uh, talked about um police activity and uh fights happening um, mm -hmm. you know it's been a bar for over i think 70 years now right. so i'm sure it's it's kind of known as a local college bar too so i'm sure that um there have been many fights that have taken place in and right. outside the building um, yeah i couldn't find anything in particular that would lead to right a significant fight or you know something where somebody got uh, seriously injured right know? it was just an impression that i got uh, from this guy that it was kind of like he was and it was a very emotional Im imprint you know what i mean sure. so it was kind of like that's why I, my radar I, I picked it up but um yeah. yeah sometimes you know i you can go to, to different locations and haunted locations or you you know for me it's they don't even i don't even have to know if they're haunted or whatever and i can just basically sense it but there's been times where i work you know walk into a, a store down in bleach neva and they'll be you know and i'll be with my family or something and i'll walk in and it's an old building you know and all of a sudden i'm sitting here you know, walking to the back of the store by where this old steam trunk, like from the Titanic is sitting on the floor and I am like drawn to it <clears throat> and I'm taking picture of it, you know, pictures of it. And I'm like, why am I taking pictures of this whole trunk? And, you know, we're supposed to be shopping and this and that, but there's times where, you know, I'll, I'll get that whole full body chills and, and there can be a, a lot of people walking around and, and doing things and shopping and this and that but it's like you know just because that stuff happens doesn't mean that everything stops you know right. sometimes in some aspects i mean but for the most part you know I've, there's a lot of a lot of activity downtown where i live and by lake geneva and yeah same with waukesha i mean there's like i said you know Wisconsin's got some really great history you know just like yeah. you know I'd, I'd love to go to chicago you know and investigate that hotel i can't remember the name the, the uh, congress, congress or the congress, correct yeah do you know about that chain uh, i've heard of it but i never really checked it out there carefully. there's been a lot of paranormal teams that have, have gone there um that would be really cool to go to there's i guess there's a story of a gentleman who i evidently have beat this lady in this one room or killed himself or, know, or something but they lot they they basically boarded up that room because it was just it was an awful scene and this and that but yeah you know i mean so it's like it's i remember what floor it's on but i mean there's been so many different stories that come out of the congress that it was just you know i mean you kind of realize that was you know back in the heyday of the prohibition and all that you know just walking downtown some of the older dock areas you know when they had all the mobsters it's just the history is just yeah Chicago's just cool. and, and the same with wisconsin you know i mean there's different places up north up by manitowish waters and mercer um 
on Spider Lake. Uh, Capone owned a, a mansion that actually had um, like towers with gun ports nice. to, to stick out. And, you know, me and my wife had actually, you know, went up there for our, one of our uh, vacations just for the weekend. And this guy was telling, telling us about that it was gifted to his uh, Al Capone's secretary. Hmm. It was one of his hideouts. Yeah, we and then and, she, and, she, and once that she passed, then a developer tried to develop it or tear it down or do something. And I think the guy basically went bankrupt. So evidently, I mean, that, as far as I know, that's still staying empty. And when we go up there again, that we wanted to go back up there to see, to stay at this uh, resort that's there by the, on the lake, the guy said that he could take us up there and we can look at it. Now, that would be a very good investigation. I can yeah. only imagine. You know what yeah, I mean? Cool. Every state has a lot of different history. You know, Indiana, Michigan, you know, so, you know there's, there's something everywhere. You know what I mean? So, yeah. but um, you investigated up north uh, when you were in college, correct, Josh? Um, or did you, were you part of a team when you were in college? Yeah, so the team that I was with, we did a couple investigations in Stoughton. Um, okay. We went to Shaker Cigar Bar before they really started doing their their tours. You know, we were we were right. in there um, just as he kind of as Bob started getting into that. Um, the one big one that um, was our claim to fame, I suppose, was the um, the uh, winery. Uh, the Belvoir Winery in, uh, oh, if you're familiar with that, it's actually like, the, uh, it's also called the Odd Fellows Home. Uh, that's where the Destination Fear team just went this past season. Okay. So they, they didn't go into the winery portion at all. They just went to the old uh, military hospital. So, um, um. Yeah, the Belvoir Winery um, used to be the Odd Fellows Home, um, and it used to be a military hospital. Um, and I think there is probably a couple hundred people that are buried on that location. There's a very large cemetery behind it. Um, we got there before all the TV shows did, um, and we actually were there the uh, the weekend of the NFL playoffs. So being a bunch of college kids at a winery watching Packer football uh, before an investigation was, was pretty fun. Um, and then we, we investigated there and we had things happen in every single part of the building. Um, eventually at one point, it was about 2 a.m., we had uh, something come through a spirit box that sounded like it was saying it was a demon. Uh, and at that point, I said, okay, investigation is over. Everyone go to bed. But at that point, nobody was really tired. And frankly, they were too afraid to go to bed. It was... Right. <laughs> it's a very energetic place. Uh, there was a lot going on. And now they, they do tours open to the public. They've had most of the TV shows there. Um, and, and they run it real well. It's a very nice place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned the, the spirit box. What other kinds of equipment do you guys use other than just the camera? Obviously, you use a lot of cameras. But what, what kind of stuff do you guys use? And how do you keep your data? And just kind of... Yeah. It's crazy how much uh, equipment has evolved in the past, even just five years. Sure. I remember when the spirit box was the hottest thing you could have, um, <laughs> along with like an EMF detector and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I'm kind of a traditionalist, minimalist sort of person. Um, I enjoy the spirit okay. box because it's got great results. Um, uh, voice recorders, multiple ones. Um, sure. A good old flash and flashlight can always be used for a, a device to communicate with spirits as well. Sure, I've seen um, it. We, we've used, you know, different things like we we tried the baking powder thing or baby powder, or whatever. You know, maybe yep. steps. Um, we've tried using one thing that emits. Um, I don't know. A if ghost feeder. Protons. It, it emits energy into the air to hopefully. Yeah, a ghost feeder, energy. EMF feeder. Yep. Right. We've tried that. Um, and in the past couple of years, I've really started just kind of making my own little devices to see if they work or not. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool, because that's what I do. I make all my own stuff. Right. Yeah, and that's what I enjoy. You know, I started making, um, um, what the hell is it called? I always call it a theremin. Um, yep, I know what those are. 
but uh, the REM pod, basically. You know, if something comes yeah. close to it, it starts to beep. And I made one sure. of those for 15 bucks, and I was like, I'm not going to spend 150 on a nice one where I could just make my own, right? Yeah, that's how I do it. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I think I, uh, it's trial and error, figuring out what works. Right, sure. right. Right, different energies that you're that are attracted to you or whatnot. You know, yeah. it's. I don't have. I just went through all my stuff yesterday because my wife asked me to, and yeah. I haven't even used half of it. And I'm like, okay, either I got. I I I probably have like four or five, you know, handheld camcorders, and wow, I've got like five or six different trail cams, which I use. I've got, uh, you know, That's half. Really good. A half dozen stands, you know, like tripods for cameras. I mean, so it's like, but it's, you know, that whole thing of maybe I'll use it, yeah. you know, I don't want to get rid of it. What if I need it? And then, you know, and on the flip side of that is, you know, how much money you could probably sell, you know, make selling these <laughs> because I, I'm not using them and I haven't right. really used them. But if I ever get to go to a big location, then I can probably utilize some of that. Right. Yeah. But there again, you know, I, I would say that I'm my own best tool. So, yeah, see, and I, I switched to computer logging for everything. Pretty, pretty much all my sensors are logged like every second and then makes computers. And then I can do statistics on them. I can do blind studies. I can do all kinds of science stuff. So that's how I do my investigations. So they're probably boring to other people because I'm just sitting there watching numbers on a counter go and kind of listening and you know voice recorders and a couple of cameras going of course but for the most part most everything i get it's some kind of computer instrument right so right. totally right. different than what normal ghost hunters ever do right you know i've always believed that um no matter what equipment you have uh, i think yep. things are either going to happen or not going to happen understood um, yep uh, that's where my minimal, minimalist kind of aspect comes into play where I think if you just have a few basic things, you know, you can get evidence from them. Yeah. Having, you know, a $3,000 device isn't going to yep. make your investigation any better or worse. Sure. Understood. It's just like, you know, kind of like, you know, we were talking about guitars before the whole mm -hmm. um, podcast started. Um, you can have a million effect pedals and the biggest amps in the world. Um, but it's all in the person playing the guitar Correct. Knowing your technique, you know, it's absolutely it's the devices you have. It's in your ability as a guitar player or in this case, uh, an investigator. Yes, I agree. I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, now. Uh, over the summer, I would say in the fall, you had taken your wife to Salem. How was that? Disappointing. OK. <laughs> um. <laughs> You know, um, I, I wasn't going to say I was let down. Um, I was underwhelmed. Okay. I, I have always loved um, witch stories ever since I first saw The Crucible in high school. I, I mm -hmm. love the play and I love the history behind Salem. Um, so I did my research. We did our own walking tours when we got there. Um, but, you know, besides the big cemeteries and... Um, you know, just the, the, the quaintness of the town. It's a very cute little town. Um, it's, there's just not much there anymore. They really tore everything down or. Um, All right. We, we, sure. we would start in the cemetery and walk 20 minutes. Okay. You know, here's the, uh, the house from that, um, that witch movie. Uh, Blair Rutt? No. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. Um, anywho, we get there and then you walk another 20 minutes to the next spot. And it's like, oh, here's where the jail used to be. And now it's a parking lot. You know, here's where right. uh, yeah, Hawthorne's sure. house used to be. Uh, now it's just a statue from Bewitched. Um, the downtown, you know, as a, as a town, Salem is very nice. It's a great place, great food, great people. Um, but a lot of the history just isn't there anymore. Sure. Which is mm -hmm. kind of like Savannah, Georgia. When I was down there, they did ghost tours. And it's supposed to be the most haunted city in all of America or whatever. And I was like, yeah, most of the stuff is still there, but you can't get near it or do anything. It's all commercialized. Right. Mm -hmm. That's Salem really is commercialized. You know, now granted, I went there or we went there during the week of Halloween. So it was basically a madhouse. Um, right. Sure. But a lot of locals in Boston, uh, I have friends in Maine, uh, they say Salem's really a day trip. You can go down there, you can see the things, you can have a bite to eat and then be back. Um, 
yep. on your vacation in no time. So great place. Uh, I'm not uh, bashing Salem at all, but I was just kind of, you know, I was expecting a bit more, I think. Right. Right. Um, have either one of you been to Gettysburg? That's on my bucket list. That's on my bucket list too. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think I'm going in like June. So, okay. I have a friend that uh, is a tour guide there. Oh, cool. Okay. And she's like, well, if you guys can get down here, I can slide you in, guys in after hours and we can do a tour. So, very nice. nice. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's on my bucket list too. I mean, that's one of the places I really want to go to. Right. But yeah, a lot, a lot of history there. So, I'm sure there's right. still the spirits that are still roaming those fields. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have I have ancestral history with uh, Civil War, and you know, um, I know that that he's probably mentioned in one of the libraries there. So it's just like I just love that that whole history aspect. You know, right. you know, being you know, a, like a history buff and just like all that history, and you know, and it's just I don't know. I just. The kids today, and I, I feel like an old old guy for saying that, but the kids today <laughs> get that. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's just one of those yeah. things. But um, so tell us a little bit about what you have coming up. It's the new year. Um, I do have one thing uh, that I told you we can't talk about. Uh, All right. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, we can talk about it soon. I'm looking forward to it very much. Um, okay. You know, we had our, uh, Jay and I had our cancel investigation last week. <laughs> um, there was a, a bit of a snowstorm and some weird feelings about the location we were going to. So we, we skipped that, but yeah. maybe we can kind of clear those things up and hopefully get back to it. Um, All right. But the individual, I told you that um, I just went back to Club 400 a couple of weeks ago. He, so he works at Carroll University, uh, which is. Oh, yeah, that's right. I yeah. my front door. Um, and it's Wisconsin's oldest university, uh, built in 1846. Um, so I've done a private tour of Carroll with somebody who used to work there. He told me, I don't know, three dozen ghost stories, uh, basically all around the campus. Uh, Carroll is featured on the Waukesha Ghost Walks tour that I do. Um, and ever since learning about more of the history and some of the things that happened there, um, this individual who I just, uh, reconnected with a couple a couple weeks ago uh he still works there he's gonna take me and jay on a, a little investigation there some night mm -hmm. um, he's had multiple things happen in every single building um, really I've got a, a good collection of stories myself where i think we can really uh pull on actual names and dates and events wow you know and speak to actual spirits you know that's one thing i'm very yep cognizant of is making sure I'm not just going into a place and like, who's here? What's this? Who is this? It's like, right, right. Hey, we're here to talk to Rachel. Right. You know, it's yeah. 1945. Talk to us about your husband or you know, your kids. Mm -hmm. I like sure. to make sure I'm connecting with spirits like they're still living people because, you know, they at one point right. were living people. So Understood. I don't like to treat them like there's some sort of painting on the wall. You know, it's right. It's, right. Like, yeah. I mean, and that's that's what a lot of people don't realize, especially that there's some um, younger investigators who don't quite get grasp that idea that these were once people as well, just like us. Right. You know, yeah. it's because they're, they're, they're past or they're they're still here you know, on the other side or, you know, they're haunting this or doing this. I mean, they were still people, you right. know, so and it. it, it it takes a while for some people to realize that once they get out, get over the thrill of, oh, it's, you know, it's a haunted location. But you got to remember, keeping that whole, these were people and treat them with respect. And that's the biggest thing, going to any location and treating them pretty much respect. So I mean, now this school is an active school. It's open. It's like, you know, correct. so, I mean, there's got to be still some people there after hours. Yeah, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll take care of it. We'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, to your last point, I, I was guilty of that at one in point in my paranormal career as well. You know, it, this was thrill-seeking. Um, mm -hmm. This is when, when I first started, it was, you know, 
just when Ghost Adventures came out. So that was like the cool thing to do, right? Sure. Right. Be a Zach Baggins. And eventually <laughs> it was, you know, I, you know, I matured and I'm at the point in my career now where it's, you know, on these talking points that we're talking, discussing, um, you know, it's taking it more seriously. You're here to help. You're here for the history. Um, but, you know, getting an EVP is also really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would sure. say that uh, being touched or being talked to or hearing something that technically shouldn't be there is probably one of the greatest thrills that people can experience in life. Yeah, um, it's just it's just so bizarre and wonderful and amazing to experience that. I don't know. I don't know what you were just talking about, but I just I had an aha moment. I mean, <laughs> you were talking about EVPs. And I can't believe I never put these two two together. Um, where I usually do my podcast on Sundays is the Maxwell Mansion. Okay, that has a lot of spirits to it. Um, when we did an investigation last year there, yeah. um, I had clear as day. Um, the name Susan comes crossed on, on the downstairs bar on the countertop after we came back in. And I was like, Susan, it was clear as day. I still think I still have it. So I'm like trying to figure out, you know, what it was. But then, you know, fast forward about a year later, I was downstairs um, talking with another person. I was actually giving her a reading. And then after we were done, we were kind of just chit chatting and this and that. And, I had seen this young woman from the twenties or thirties and I was like, and cause the air could, the air change, everything changed in this right. atmosphere. We were the only ones down there. So I was kind of like, you know, I was kind of felt charged in this and that. And then she asked um, the lady, I was the, old, the bartender asked who it was. And I said, you know, I got the name Susie. Well, I just now put the two, two together. <laughs> because I had Susan and then I had Susie yeah. because that and that what was that was short you know what I mean because there was a there was a guy there that in a male's voice asking basically where's Susan where's Susan you know what I mean so and then I got that and I'm like so you know I guess I have aha moments at you know random times but that was just I can't believe I never really put that two two together now I understand why <laughs> But well, I'm glad I could make that EVP, EVPs. They're great to get. I mean, when you get them, you know, it's you feel like a kid again. You know, right. uh, and that's one of the, the greatest things you can share with people is an EVP. Uh, I mean, next to capturing something on a, a camera or a video camera, um, I, you know, EVPs are just like the you know the gold standard for uh, investigations. You know, sure. getting one of those is just like. You just want to throw your fist in the air when you hear it for the first time. <laughs> yeah, usually for me, it's a you know a statistical bump in the data you yeah. know, on an answer to a question. I mean, right. literally, it happens right in the few seconds that you just asked it. It's like, oh yeah, that's different. You know, yeah. so for me, it's a totally different. I mean, I I kind of do the EVP thing, but almost never. I mean, I listen to it real quick. Okay, nothing there. Keep moving, but. For, you know, but occasionally we've had EVPs line up with, you know, like a spike in radiation or, you know, a drop in the magnetic field or, you know, it's like, oh, OK, well, we got two things at the exact same time, you know, literally seconds apart. So that, that gives a little more validation to both sides. Right. Right. So you're more of a validated person. You know, like if, if it's yeah. coming across and, and it, the data lines up, then. Yeah, well, that's you know that's why it's nice to have the computer because there's no human bias in it. Right. You know, the computer records what it records every second. It's recording mm -hmm. every sensor. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can sometimes think, see things happen across multiple sensors, right within the same like five second window. Right. You know? And then if you get an EVP or something like that at the same time again, then you know your chances of something being non-normal is pretty high. So, right. you know, and a lot of times I don't even know it till after I've already left because my equipment doesn't really give you any, I guess, real time info, you know, but it's logging it onto a thumb drive or whatever. And you get you get home and you you throw it in the stat software and you start lining up the spikes and you start lining up the videos and the EVPs. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden you realize, oh, yeah, we got a you know, we got an EVP and, you know, some magnetic field changes and 
and they all lined up, you know, or happened multiple times, you know, and, and of course, at this point, you can, when you're doing statistics on it, you can actually say, hey, look, here's the data, here's the statistics, here's the spikes, here's the spot, you right. know, you got something tangible to show right. another human and say, yes, other than I just saw something or something touched, me, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, so, I'm, I do a stuff a little different than a normal investigator. But... Well, so on that seeing stuff, um, I'm going to ask both of you: Have you ever recorded anything that you found that had, after you found it and you knew that you recorded it, disappeared? Hmm. I would say no. It's. I, I'm going to say no. I've only okay. had it happen where. Obviously, you don't hear the EVPs in real time, but then you go back and you're like, "How the hell?" Of course, was that there, you know. Right. I've, no, I've never had something disappear like that. Okay, I just was curious. I mean, I've actually caught a, a shadow at the mansion um, where I do the podcast, and I had it recording and I had it on video, and the shadow came and went, and it was in. I, I mean, I got chills. I was like, "Holy cow!" When I went to turn around, and I had. She closed it and saved it. I mean, it's just automatically. When I told her that, you know, I, I my friend and it wasn't there. I looked for it and searched and searched and it was not there. So, do you? Would you think, Shane? I guess this question for you: Would you? Do you think that the energies, since that you do a lot of that with with electronics and all that stuff, do you think that there's a possible way that they could manipulate that? Oh, I agree. Yeah, they could. Um, matter of fact, I had thought about that when I was building the equipment and the equipment software has, you know, uh, like watchdog kind of routines that basically if it stops recording, if anything happens that's outside of parameters, I mean, any kind of a malfunction, mm -hmm. it immediately buzzes a buzzer so I can run over there quick and figure, okay, why did it stop recording? What happened? You know, so, so far I've never had it you know, show up like I recorded all night and there just wasn't anything there or anything because, you know, the, the safety's trip and it, it's like, oh mm -hmm. yeah, you know, so right, it can't, right. you can't, <clears throat> you can't sneak around it. They can't mess with it much or they set off the buzzer. Right. So, but that was something I actually contemplated because other people always talk about, well, I recorded and I had this great EVP and then they go to play it back and it's like, oh, it's not there. Right. So I wanted to make sure I was recording. Yeah. It's I've had something that that has disappeared. I mean, but a couple. But here's the thing. Yeah, it's it's, like it's a drain battery thing. You yeah, know? you know, and and I think that that was that's another uh, part of it too. Is you know, have you you experienced that, Josh? I'm assuming that you've experienced power drainage from batteries when you're investigating, or even if you're not investigating. Yeah, I've had that happen um, a number of times. So I just I've learned my lesson to just bring a lot of backup batteries. Yeah, we actually had this really interesting thing happen. Um, we brought like a security system with four cameras and a hard drive and everything. And we get there and we're set it up and it's working. Turn it off, you know, have dinner, you know, prep. Turn it back on. And the we had this super nerd guy who knows all the computer stuff. Sorry, Shane. That'd be me. I mean, you're into <laughs> all the technical stuff. But like this guy was like super computer guy, way beyond my capabilities. And he says somehow the hard drive got disconnected. I think from the motherboard, correct? Yep. And like, he's like, the only way you could possibly do that was to unscrew it, go into the the computer and disconnect the cable. Correct. And he's like, it was just sitting there. It was working. It was recording. Go to dinner, come back. He's like, no, we can't use it anymore because I don't know how to fix it. <laughs> wow. Which it's like, I'm, that, that, that was one of the moments where I was, and that, th this place we were at, We've seen stuff. We've been touched. We've been talked to. Mm -hmm. We've had the best evidence of almost the best evidence of my career at this location. So mm -hmm. something to somehow unplug a, 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 you know, a hard drive from a computer. I'm like, it seems plausible to me. Yeah. Well, and we've actually done because of this whole battery drain thing. That's actually one of the things that I do when I go on investigation. I'll take a brand new pack of Duracells. And I'll take my meter and I'll check the voltage of them all and write them on and put a sticker on the side. Oh, sure. And mm -hmm. then I'll set them all around the place. And then at the end of the investigation, I'll collect them and remeasure them again. So mm -hmm. far, I have not seen one ever change. But 
maybe because it's so intentional, they decide to leave it alone. I don't know, you sure. know, play a joke on me, but I have never seen one change. You know, to, to me, it feels like because investigations are so traumatic events for when people are especially getting ready for them, they're all tizzied. My guess is 80% of the time that people forget to charge whatever it is. Yeah. But that's just my, you know, there's just so much going. They're trying to load the vehicle. They're trying to get all their stuff in there. They're trying to remember everything. And they got stuff on chargers all over the place, but they're forgetting a couple batteries that are important. You know, that's, right. as far as I can tell, that's what it is. But, but I have done this fairly faithfully on most investigations because everybody keeps saying, oh, my stuff drained and I didn't get anything. It's right. like, uh, I don't know. Here's a, here's a question for you, Shane. Sure. Oh, my friend Katie. Hello, Katie. Um, you know, honestly, I have never checked to see if they drain during barometric pressure drops, but I do now have the capability because barometric pressure is one of the things that my sensor board picks up. So if I get a battery that does actually do a drain, I can actually plot a graph of its drain versus barometric pressure and find out. Hmm. That's crazy. Yeah, that's a good thing. So, yeah. So you come so, up with your idea, you come up with these things, and then you can just make millions, right? There you go. <laughs> well, you know, I would say amongst the many people that I have been involved with, um, there is a desire uh, to have specialty built stuff for what yeah. they want to do. You know, they, we don't want all want to go to Ghost Stop and purchase their, their pre-made things. You know, we want yeah, they're ridiculously stuff. priced things. Right. <laughs> we want stuff that's tailored to us. You know, I I, I grew up when yep. uh, the, the Ghost Box, you had to go to Radio Shack and make that on your own. Yeah. Well, and there's all a lot of fake equipment out there too. I mean, right. like I say, I reviewed somebody's Chinese REM pod knockoff. And once I actually took it apart and started diagnosing what the circuit actually did, it literally was a random timer that flashed lights and played the beep sound Ugh. at random intervals. Right. It's like, <laughs> uh, how about no? <laughs> it's a good thing you didn't pay much for the thing. Right. right. So. Yeah. So yeah, you, you, a lot of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, when something good comes out, and this goes with anything, you know, and something good comes out, somebody's also going to make a knockoff, yeah. you know, or somebody's going to they're going to make something that will convince somebody saying, "Hey, that's just like the new." No. Yeah, if it's quarter the cost, it, something ain't right. Right. Yeah. And that my my father's favorite saying was, "You get what you pay for." Yeah, pretty much. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But, yeah. But yeah designing custom stuff is it's pretty fun and it's cool to see how your sensors fare when they're out there i mean we're doing 26 sensors at once right now the last time i looked at my board so so it's kind of neat because you can see the correlation of everything together all at once right. and so if you throw graphs up you can see if the spikes line up i mean you can do all kinds of stuff you can't do just by listening to things or watching a video you know? right katie had a, had a good statement <laughs> I was just laughing at that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We like lights and buzzers and beepers and yeah. stuff to interact with right. probably more than the ghost does. Yeah, just like a two year old. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I mean, so I mean there's so much different different stuff. I, I think it's it goes back to people who are making stuff. I mean, I think that's great that they want to make stuff. I mean, I've made stuff, you know what I mean? I've got I got two things that I've created that, you know, I, I, I know they work. Um, I just haven't really had a chance to really use them. Um, but there again, you know, it's like, I don't know. There's people that, that want to build stuff just to sell stuff, you know? Yeah, I, I, I've never sold all my stuff. Yeah, I, I, I just want, I'd like, to, I built a couple of those things for myself and for my team because I just, that's all I did. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, and then I, but if I have somebody who says, Hey, you know, you build me one and I'll buy one. It's like, yeah, that's great. But it's a little bit of work. And yeah, that's what my problem is. Talked about the, hours the, the device, you know I mean? That thing takes you a while to build that. I mean, yeah, you'd have to charge it quite a bit. Yeah. Oh yeah. I just see that Robert had a really good comment that um, sometimes oh, yeah. afraid of these machines. And so, what I like to do whenever I go to a location for the first time is I explain in terms that this person, this spirit could potentially understand like, Hey, this is a little box that allows me to talk to you um, mm -hmm. because I can hear yep. you very well. 
So if you want to talk or discuss things or answer questions, you have to do it through this. And I, you know, I explain like a two-year-old how it operates. Yeah, um, very good. He's, he's got a great point that they're afraid. They don't know how they work. They don't know what to do. So yeah, you just got to right. explain, this, um, you know, maybe this person was from the 1920s. They have no idea what a what a ghost box is or a, oh, of course. a yes. voice recorder, you know? You just got to explain it in simple terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially with things like EMF feeders where you're pushing mass quantities of EMF into the air right. intentionally. They're probably like, whoa, we crap. What the heck is that? Right, right. right. You know, like, EM, like, uh, like EM pumps, you know? Yep. Yeah, because oh. I got an EM pump built onto the board that I can cycle on and off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I can... I can watch to see if they if they mess with it at all. It causes changes in the sensors, so mm -hmm. it's pretty mm -hmm. neat. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's just there's a lot of people don't realize that, it, that it's not. Some people aren't going to be you know as educated in that sense. You know what I mean? I mean, sure. people are gonna be like, "What is this? You know, why is this doing this?" You know, right. I mean, sometimes when when you show up at a location and it's you know, that you know that our spirits are, but everybody sees the lights after everybody's outside. Yeah. You go inside and nothing happens. You know what I mean? It's because mm -hmm. like Robert said, you know, there's a lot of them are probably scared or just get ish or yeah. don't understand. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but yeah. Well, all folks, right. that's pretty much what we all have today. And we want to thank everybody for, for viewing our, another episode of studio six paranormal podcast. Uh, we want to thank, Shane Feek, my co-host, and I also want to thank our guest, Josh Hughes. This has yeah, been, been awesome. Fantastic, and um, we will definitely have to do this again. And then you'll have to come back when you can talk about certain things that you can't talk about right now. So, <laughs> um, um, so yes, I appreciate the time. And thank you, everybody, for the great comments. It's been a great discussion. Yes, yes very, very well. And thank you, everybody. So yep. Yep. we will catch you probably in the next couple weeks. All right, Bye, stay everybody. warm. All right.